refuting the uh, legendary hypothesis, which is the view that uh, Jesus was merely a legend. And uh, uh, this is uh, Dr. Robert Price is the, the leader in, in this movement. I uh, got to debate him on the Internet Infidel radio show uh, uh, about a year ago. And uh, uh, But you'll also find others like atheist Doug Kruger and uh, Jeffrey J. Louder that are starting to embrace this uh, as well. But this is an outdated view. And uh, last week we talked about the eight assumptions of the legendary Jesus theorist. Uh, these are eight assumptions that uh, Paul Eddy and uh, Gregory Boyd give in their, their book, The Jesus Legend. Remember, they assume uh, naturalism, that miracles are impossible. Secondly, they assume that first century Jews, especially Galilean Jews, Jews from the north, uh, where Jesus and the apostles were from, that they were very Hellenistic, very influenced by the Greek culture, and uh, uh, if not, actually just straight out pagan. So that's another uh, assumption there that these guys were, were pagan. Uh, they also believe that there's true legendary parallels to the Jesus story. Uh, in reality, what we find is that if you describe these ancient pagan myths using Christian terminology, wow, it sounds so much like Christianity. But the ancient pagans never described uh, their myths using Christian terminology. So if you, just, if you just describe the myths the way the pagans did, the parallels don't even don't even appear. Um, uh, number four, there's uh, they believe there's silence about Jesus in ancient non-Christian writings. Uh, where do they get that assumption from? Easy, they just deny anything that's mentioned about Jesus. They either say, well, a Christian uh, added that to the text; it's an interpolation, or uh, they say, well, yeah, Pliny the Younger did write about that, but he got his information from Christians. And, you know, I guess he's a Roman governor and he's, he's such an ignoramus, such an idiot, that uh, he didn't even know that uh, 70 years, 70, 80 years earlier, that there really was no guy named Jesus. But he, you know, listened to the stories that were being told and believed it. And, uh, you know, these legendary theorists, they, they act like they know better than the contemporaries of Jesus and that they could explain all these writings about Jesus. Remember last week we mentioned 42 different authors that uh, mentioned Jesus within 150 years of his death. With Tiberius Caesar, there's only 10 authors that mentioned him within 150 years of his death. So, so why is the carpenter from Nazareth, why is there four times as, as many mentions of him than the Roman emperor? Uh, of his day. Uh, okay, uh, also they believe there's silence about Jesus' life in Paul's writings. Uh, remember my response to that was twofold. Number one, uh, Paul presupposed, he assumed, his readers already had a knowledge of the gospel, either orally, it was either preached to them, or they actually had a copy of the gospel. Maybe the gospel was written earlier than New Testament critics think. Um, so he didn't have to go through all the details. That's number one. But number two, if you put just the seven accepted epistles of the Apostle Paul, and by the seven, what I mean there is that virtually all New Testament critics, no matter how far left they are, accept at least seven of Paul's uh, 13 letters. But if you just take those alone, you can come up with about 30 to 35 different details of the life of Christ. So Paul is not as silent as these guys would have us uh, to believe. In fact, now apparently Robert Price is arguing that Paul wrote none of the New Testament books. And I believe, I was just told recently that now he's even questioning whether Paul even ever existed. So, I mean, look, if you want to do history that way and be a total skeptic about the entire first century, fine. But the rest of the world knows good history when they see it. And there is good historical evidence that Jesus existed that he died on the cross, he claimed to be Savior and God, and that he bodily rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples. Uh, 
Uh, number six, the assumption of the legendary Jesus theorists uh, that there's unreliable oral traditions that led to the Gospels. And number one, they're, you know, they're, they're assuming the Gospels were written very late. Maybe they were written earlier. Uh, number two, uh, the burden of proof is on them to show the oral traditions were unreliable. Even Marcus Borg and uh, Gerd Ludman of the Jesus Seminar, two of the world's leading New Testament liberal critics, they acknowledge that the ancient creed listing the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8, that that goes back to within a year or two of uh, Jesus' death. Ludman believes that Paul got it in Damascus right after getting saved, since the Jews he had been, the Christians he had been tra chasing out there had come from Jerusalem. Uh, number seven, that the Gospels are contradictory and unreliable, and, you know, but you have four different accounts of the same events. You're going to get different perspectives, but no one's ever proven uh, a real, full-blown contradiction. They assume contradictions everywhere. And then number eight, they argue the burden of proof rests on those who argue for the reliability of the Gospels. I, I just disagree. I mean, in any, any ancient historical document, the burden of proof is on those who would question the historicity of those documents. And so it's kind of uh, innocent till proven guilty. Uh, now what I want to do tonight is just talk about uh, just a general response uh, to the myth and legend hypothesis, and then in the weeks to come we can uh, we can get into uh, more details on it. But Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland. And his work, Scaling the Secular City, he has a few pages that deal with it. And he gives a really good summary of another Christian philosopher, the late Ronald Nash. And Ronald Nash wrote, uh, what was it, Christianity and the Greeks? And uh, where he has a scholarly work about 250 to 300 pages refuting this hypothesis. Well, Moreland gives a really good summary, and I've read both, uh, but your head can really spin when Nash is dealing with all the details there. But in Moreland's Scaling the Secular City, uh, he has in just a few pages, uh, he has a really good, some really good responses now. Uh, so the general response would be, number one, the early church was rooted in Judaism. So the early church was Jewish, okay? You got you have to start there. If you don't start there, it's gone, okay? Even even the most liberal of New Testament critics today acknowledge that there's no way to to find any historical data about Jesus unless we put Jesus back in his Jewish culture, okay? And. Um, uh, and the Jews were so Jewish that they didn't want any paganism blending with their Jewish faith. That's why the Romans gave them an, ex an exemption. Everybody else had to say, Caesar is Lord. The Jews would say, no, Yahweh is Lord. And the Romans gave them an, ex an, ex an ex exemption from that uh, because they refused to give in. So the idea that the early... The first century Jews were very Hellenistic and paganistic, just is not the case. Number two, uh, and this just flows from it, Gentile influence was minimal. Okay? Uh, I mean, the Jews were always having riots because they didn't want to be influenced by the, by the Gentiles. The Jews dressed differently, they wore their hair differently, uh, they acted differently, and uh, they were proud to be Jewish. Uh, so this, this idea that the, you know, Robert Price and the legendary Jesus theorists uh, are just blowing smoke. This, 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 uh, there's no historical basis there. Uh, also, with the mystery religions, and the uh, 
ancient mystery religions, you know, it's secret handshakes and supposedly dying and rising gods. Moreland summarizes Nash's case against that with several points. Number one, everybody understood that they were never meant to be historical. Okay? It's not historical. I mean, uh, uh, you know, flows from it, usually associated with crop cycles, the seasons, the four seasons, you know, the vegetation dies in the fall and the winter, and then comes back to life in the spring, okay? So these stories about supposedly gods dying and rising, all these stories, nobody took literally, nobody was like, man, I wonder what it would be like to, when Osiris was alive. Well, even the, even the people who are members of the Osiris cult, they never asked that question. If somebody, if somebody asked that question, they'd all laugh. That idiot thinks Osiris was really alive. Okay? Uh, so, uh, it was never really tied into history. Now, you look at the Gospels. They'll tell you who the Caesar, who the Roman Emperor was, who the governor was, when a census was taken, what the surroundings are like, what city you're in. And uh, uh, not so with th these mystery religions. I mean, this is not comparing apples and oranges. This is more like comparing apples and rocks. Okay? Um, they're not even close. Uh, the uh, similarities with Jesus are apparent. Uh, they're not real. Okay. Again, the, the, the sleight of hand that is done, and this was happening in the 1870s as well with F.C. Bauer and people like that, and then with pop writers in the early to mid 20th century. And uh, but it was only in this in scholarship for about 20 years in the late 1800s, and then scholars just rejected it, and so then it was just more of a uh, a pop type thing, but. Um, um, but what these guys did, as I mentioned earlier, they would take, they would describe the mystery religion using clear, precise Christian terminology. Okay? So that it made it sound like, oh wow, yeah, that does have so much in common with Christianity. But if you use the terminology, that was used by those in the mystery religions, it, it doesn't even sound anything like uh, Christianity. I mean, you start saying, you start throwing around phrases like born again, redemption, resurrection, sacrificial death. Yeah, that sounds like Christianity. The problem is those aren't in the mystery religions. Well, like with Osiris, they say, well, Osiris was, um, he died, and then he was thrown into the Nile River, so he was baptized. And then he rose again from the Nile River. Yeah. And what it was, in the jealous rage, it was his it was his brother in law or brother or something like that, cut him into fourteen pieces, pieces. and scattered his body. Then Osi uh, Isis went back yeah. and was able to find thirteen of the fourteen pieces. Yeah. And then she she like she brought the pieces back together, like and wrapped them up like the yeah. mummy or whatever. And then, <clears throat> but when you when you say it in Christian terms, yeah. cause that's not, not that's not Christian yeah. at all. It's it's bloody and it's grotesque. Yeah, it's not even a full blown. It's not even a full blown resuscitation. Yeah, uh, because, because he, 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 not only did they only put together thirteen of the fourteen pieces, yeah. and he certainly didn't die for anybody else. No, uh, he wasn't dying for mankind. He wasn't uh, mankind. But also, he was the. the uh, what did the Michael Lacona says? A friend of his uh, refers to it as a zombification. Yeah, and then he like because he he comes or back or to or life or in the netherworld. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like he's the king of Hades or something like but, that. But if he's got he nothing, died, was yeah. baptized in the Nile and rose again, if you use Christian yeah. terms, but then it, it's a bit of a lie, but it, yeah. it sounds more Christian. Even with the cult of Mithra, their initiation, yeah. right, where a bull is slaughtered and you, you're underneath and getting bled on, well, when they start referring to it as a baptism and, blood, and yeah. saved by the blood, they start using all Christian terminology, yeah. it makes it sound a lot like Christianity. You take away the Christian phrases, you got a bunch of 
of wild, um, hyper-emotional pagans, uh, and a bull is being slaughtered and bleeding all over them. That's got nothing to do with Christianity. What's it? We got nothing but Christians in this room. When's the last time you went to a church where they slaughtered a bull or any animal and there's blood all over us? Okay, uh, that's just the, it, that doesn't sound anything like it. But if you use the Christian terminology, you can uh, you can fool enough people there. Do that. Um, Maybe people would respect me. Uh, okay. Probably they were these. Mystery religions were polytheistic and syncretistic. Polytheistic means they believed in many gods. So it's got like nothing to do with the Jewish faith, which Christianity grew out of, which was monotheistic, belief in only one God. And it was uh, uh, the Jewish faith and Christianity are monotheistic and exclusivistic. Monotheistic, belief in only one God exclusivistic uh, meaning only the true religion saves and we don't borrow from other religions uh, these guys in the mystery religions believed in many gods and they were syncretistic they never met a god they didn't like so they would just add for the, just the, the ancient Greeks the ancient Romans they uh, the, the Romans when they conquered the Greeks they just took they said well this Greek is a lot like uh, uh, our Greek God, so we'll, we'll just uh, we'll just retain that Greek God, but we'll just call him by the name that we've always called him. And if we don't have one that fits that, we'll just add that Greek God to our pantheon. The Romans never met a God they didn't like, and uh, so they blend together religions. So it's more New Age, uh, like the way we think today, is more like New Age movement, where all religions lead to God type of thinking. So this is the antithesis of the Jewish faith and Christianity which which grew from that um, okay and then uh, uh, also you have no no real resurrection okay again uh, Don was talking about you know Cyrus <clears throat> Gets killed and chopped up into 14 pieces, and then his cohort puts 13 of the 14 pieces back together, and then he rules in the netherworld. Uh, uh, at best, it's a crude resuscitation, a restoration to the former life, or at least 13 fourteenths of it. Um, but it's not a full-blown resurrection where Jesus came back to life, never to die again, conquering death, his mortal body put on immortality. Okay? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, you know, one of the, one of the strongest arguments, you'll see it N.T. Wright, J.P. Moreland, and several others for Christianity, the idea of the resurrection had to come from somewhere. It didn't come from paganism, because, you know, the Greek thought, really, when everything was said and done, if you were considered an intellectual Greek, because of Plato's strong influence, uh, they were they were looking for the immortality of the soul. They were not looking for a resurrection of the body. So every time Paul mentioned resurrection, the Greeks would laugh at him. Okay, so they didn't get it from the Greek culture. What about the Jews? Well, the Jews believed in a resurrection, but a general resurrection, and at the end of time not a resurrection of an individual before the end of time has come. And so basically the only place really the Christians could have got the idea of the resurrection from was from Christianity itself. In other words, that defines the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection from the dead and his deity, that's what defines Christianity and separates it from Judaism and all other religions. That's why Larry Hurtado, the University of Edinburgh, the world's leading New Testament scholars in his work, the Lord Jesus Christ, he shows that the early church partook of binitarian worship. They were monotheists. They believed in one God, but they worshipped the Son alongside the Father as a separate person from the Father as early as the early 30s A.D. He said, as far back as you can go with Christianity, that's what they taught. It took them a while to figure out the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then to, to have full-blown Trinitarian worship. Uh, the Binitarian worship goes right back to the early 30s A.D. Jesus was crucified about 30 A.D. 
So then Larry Hurtado says, in fact, that's what defines Christianity. If they weren't worshipping Jesus alongside the Father, they would have still been considered Jews. So, there's no way... So, basically, if you take the resurrection and the deity of Christ out of the picture, you'd have no explanation for how Christianity got started. Okay? So, uh... uh okay, and then, uh... The real parallels, there are some real parallels here. The real parallels all date after Christianity. Okay? And um, sometimes those real parallels, by the way, if there's a real parallel, it could be coincidental. Okay? Uh, but more times than not, somebody borrowed from somebody. And uh, in many of the cases, the mystery religions, because Christianity was growing so rapidly, they were, it was like, can't beat them, join them. They were borrowing from Christianity. And so all of a sudden, there's an awful lot of uh, dying and rising gods after Christianity has been around for about a hundred years. You get all these dying and rising gods. But you go to their earlier texts, which predate Christianity, and they weren't really gods in most cases, and they really didn't die and rise either. So uh, so the real parallels date after it. Now, by the way, uh, with the Mithras cult, uh, uh, December 25th was the key day uh, of worship there. And so the church did, uh, I don't know if it was 350, 400 AD, did borrow from Mithraism. But, but there, you have to look at what's going on there. Two, you know, two things need to be stated. Number one, you had these pagans in the Roman Empire, and all they had, they were poor, all they had was their feast days. So as Christianity became a state religion, they understood, the emperor understood, you can't take the feast away from the people, but I don't want them worshiping false gods. Let's take their feast days, and let's have a Christian takeover of the feast days and incorporate Christian meaning. There are, uh, there are no Christians. I don't think there's any church father throughout the centuries who really believed Jesus was born on December 25th. Mm -hmm. That was just a convenient feast day um, to take there. Um, now, um, now, the other point is, if Christianity, by the 4th or 5th century, started borrowing something from pagan myths, that's too late for the Jesus legend theorists. It doesn't help them. In fact, I would even argue, I, I would even argue that um, uh, the whole idea of a priesthood that doesn't marry, a clergy that doesn't marry, I think we borrowed that from the Gnostic heretics. Okay? So, uh, and I think we borrowed that, like, you know, mid-2nd century to early 3rd century, we started picking up those items. So by the time of Augustine, it was thought to be holy meant you had to be celibate. And uh, there were heretics. Marcion was teaching that. And, uh, or, and uh, I believe Montanus. And then, uh, and then of course, the Gnostics. So, so whatever the case, um, um, any real parallels are, are too late. You got to find if you're going to say this, this this led this created Christianity. You got to get to the 30s A.D. and uh, and so what you have uh, also too with Gnosticism. Some say it came from Gnosticism. There's no full blown pre-Christian Gnosticism. We're going to have to close there. We'll talk about that next week. What Gnosticism is. And um, Gnosticism itself was a heretical offshoot of Christianity. Christianity had to be there uh, before Gnosticism uh, was founded. So if any borrowing went on there, the Gnostics borrowed from the Christians. What he called pre-scientific. Okay? And, um, and so let's, let's look at that.
Not pre-scientific, maybe pre-technological. Well, he calls them pre-scientific, so I'll just go with what Mr. Dawkins, or Dr. Dawkins says, because he's so brilliant. Um, so uh, He says they were pre-scientific. What he means is before the advent of modern science, so what he's saying is they really didn't know about natural laws. Okay, the laws of nature. And... Uh, now, follow that out. So these guys didn't know the laws. Of, and, I, and I would agree that the, uh, the early church, you know, the early church didn't know the titles of the laws of nature that we have now, like, like gravity and things of that sort, and then the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, okay? But they understood the concept that... The, the founders of Christianity had to know the natural law that dead bodies are supposed to stay dead. Because if they didn't know, if they were as pre-scientific as Richard Dawkins thought, if they didn't know, if they were such scientific ignoramuses, they didn't know dead bodies are supposed to stay dead, and when Jesus rose from the dead, this would have been their response. Oh, Wow. He's not dead anymore. I guess dead bodies don't stay dead after all. That's something. But they, instead, they worshipped him as God. They trusted him for salvation, and then they were willing to die for him. Why? Because they knew dead bodies are supposed to stay dead. Jesus' dead body didn't stay dead. He conquered the grave. He is God and Savior. And we need to fearlessly proclaim the good news of salvation through Jesus, even if they throw us the wild beast. So... Uh, Richard Dawkins can say that all he wants. The guy was an Oxford scholar, but the fact of the matter is if you say something dumb, it's still dumb. It doesn't matter what your pedigree is, where where you taught, where you got your degrees. The statement that the apostles were pre-scientific, and so they were so gullible that they thought Jesus rose from the dead, it doesn't follow, because if they were that gullible, that pre-scientific, they wouldn't be surprised that he rose from the dead. So they had to know enough about science, enough about natural laws, to know that uh, Jesus' resurrection was a supernatural thing that only God could do. So uh, now, what I want to talk about a little bit is about Gnosticism. And I don't want to get too in-depth on this, but the fact of the matter is, uh, Moreland, you know, brought it up there, so I better define it. But Gnosticism from, comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Okay, and so Gnosticism taught salvation through secret knowledge. Okay, so it's a different religion than Christianity. Christianity teaches salvation by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. So, uh, Gnosticism taught salvation through secret knowledge. Um, it had, uh, it may have had its roots in some of the mystery religions, some of the Greek mystery religions, a little bit of Greek philosophy. They didn't like uh, the resurrection, stuff like that. In fact, they believed that the Old Testament God was evil because he was a creator. And the whole physical world, the whole physical realm, is evil. Now, the New Testament God is good, okay? And so God could not become a man because the spirit is good, but the flesh is evil. So there's no... they, they deny any kind of a resurrection... Of Jesus, in fact, they died, deny a real death of Jesus. Jesus, they were Docetists. The Docetist heresy, they believe Jesus only appeared or pretended to be a man. See, it was Gnostic writings that Muhammad heard about and thought that Gnostic, this aspect of Gnosticism was good. Christian theology and 
So a few hundred years, in fact, they, there, was, there was Gnostic ideas that were popular still when Muhammad was alive, and he heard this idea that Jesus didn't really die on the cross and had no idea that the whole reason for heretics making up the idea that Jesus didn't really die on the cross was because they were denying the goodness and the, uh, they were denying that the physical realm was even redeemable. Uh, it's not like the Gnostics believe the physical world is fallen like Christians do. They believe if it's physical, it automatically is evil. It could never be good. So any god that created the physical realm must, by definition, be an evil god. Okay? So these guys were not Jewish at all. So whenever somebody... And there are a lot of good Christian scholars that still make this mistake. And they act like the Colossian heretics that Paul warned the Colossian believers about. And they act like, well, they were Gnostics. No, they were a pre-Gnostic belief system that had cer certain aspects that were similar to the Gnostics. But those heretics were heavy on the Old Testament. They liked the Old Testament. They believed you had to get circumcised to be saved. Um, so it was a very Jewish um, pre-Gnostic belief system. So, so, so it's kind of like, here you have Christianity, okay? And eventually Gnosticism arrives uh, Whatever the case, Gnosticism. Now you got some pagan, maybe mystery religions that had an influence on Gnosticism. You also had some Greek philosophy, some Greek philosophical beliefs, and these things may have predated Christianity, but not Gnosticism itself. And, uh, uh, but you also have with the the Colossians, you had some pagan and philosophical influence there. So they might have had something in common way back here, but the Colossians embraced, you know, you got also Judaism, and that was an influence on, on Col the Colossian heretics, but not on Gnosticism, okay? So, whatever the case, now, if people want to talk about a pre-Christian Gnosticism with a small g, um, you know, lots of different secret religions, like, 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 like Freemasonry, you know, secret handshakes, and only the initiated are, mm -hmm. are saved, and stuff like that, there might have been a lot of uh, Gnosticisms with a small g predating Christianity, um, beliefs that their salvation is their secret knowledge, but they, but they have nothing to do with each other. What we call Gnosticism with a capital G, I mean, just re read Simone Petremont's uh, work on, uh, on Gnosticism, and, uh, and that goes over the latest cutting-edge scholarship that is now agreed upon that there could be no Gnosticism without Paul and John's writings because Gnosticism is a perversion of those right the, the light versus darkness, the spirit versus flesh, they just blow those uh, contrasts way out of proportion. Okay? So, um, so whatever the case, with more, more or less point, though, is that there's no full-blown pre-Christian Gnosticism in the fullest sense of the word Gnosticism. <clears throat> now, if you want to hold to, to lots of little non-related Gnosticisms, that's fine. The problem is, when we say Gnosticism, we mean the full-blown mm -hmm. Gnosticism that got its, its earliest, you know, you've got a Docetist trend probably about 85 to 95 A.D., and Ignatius is still refuting that in 107 A.D. Uh, John and, and First John is refuting it. Um, the idea that Jesus only appeared to be a man, he really didn't come in the flesh, um, but as far as Gnostic beliefs, the earliest it can be dated is 140 or 150 A.D. with the writing of the Gospel of Thomas, which is a uh, pseudepig pseudepigraphal work. It really wasn't written by the Apostle Thomas. And um, so, whatever the case, um, 
uh, you know, and Irenaeus is refuting it by 180 A.D. Uh, so uh, but before 140 or 150 A.D., you don't have this Gnosticism. Uh, you don't have this, this full-blown uh, belief system. Uh, okay, a uh, few other points I need to make. Uh, first century Palestinian Jews, and, you know, the word Palestine actually comes from a perversion of the word Philistine, so we use it, but in reality, um, it's not really Palestine at all. It's, it's Israel. And today's Palestinians really don't have much to do with, uh, if anything, with the, uh, the, the land going that far back. Uh, although I do would say that the Jewish Palestinian dispute is, is actually more complicated than most evangelical Christians think. There are, there are some Palestinian Christians who love the Lord and we just look the other way as the Jewish state just, just doesn't recognize any rights for them. And, um, but whatever the case, uh, the first century Palestinian Jews, by that the Jews that lived in either Galilee or Judea, you know, you had Samaria in the middle, no Jews would live there. And um, uh, but he argued that first century Palestinian Jews rejected pagan beliefs and practices. That's Martin Hangel. I believe he's still alive. Um, um, he is like, I mean, this guy is like way up there among the leading leading theologians in the world and New Testament scholars. And, um, and he basically said, look, the, the, the Jews just rejected these pagan beliefs and practices. In fact, Hangel is now argues that uh, it's from uh, Tübingen, University, he argues that uh, the Gospels uh, got their titles by the last one-third, the final one-third of the first century, or the first one-third of the second century. So he's saying somewhere between 70 A.D. and 130 A.D., the Gospels got their titles probably closer to the first century day. So this guy's this guy's saying that the Gospels were written earlier than most scholars think, and they would have been titled once people knew there's more than one Gospel floating around. We got to start titling it based on who the author was, so we don't get them confused. Um, also, during the time of Jesus, the Galilean city of Sepphoris was only superficially influenced by Greek culture. That's Eddie and Boyd, pages 114 and 115. Let me talk a little bit about Sephoris. Uh, by the way, uh, the History Channel, or the Learning Channel, I don't know which one it was, did an entire hour-long program on this, like trying to disprove Jesus based on... Oops. For us. It's in, it was in Galilee, okay? Very close, not far at all from Nazareth, okay? And um, and they had like an amphitheater there that they believe like Greek plays um, were uh, performed there. And so they try to argue, man, this has got this, this is so Hellenistic, this is so Greek. I mean, if you're a Jew from Galilee, because it's the forest, there's a leading trade area, and you got all these Gentiles. So for all practical purposes, the Jews from Galilee, especially the Nazareth, the forest area, um, they were pretty much Gentiles. They were pretty much pagans. Okay? And um, um, in reality, all the evidence of Sephoris that is pagan, it all comes down to like um, second century or beyond. Okay? Um, you can even make a case it was after the destruction of the temple, the Jews are scattered, and the Romans started purposely um, populating areas of quote unquote Palestine to make it less and less Jewish because they don't want to go through another. Uh, pr problem like that. But there's no evidence during the time of Christ. Uh, you've got evidence of synagogues in uh, 
throughout first century Israel, whether it's in Galilee to the north or Judea to the south, and with, with synagogues, you know, they were made for the purpose of teaching the Old Testament, the rabbis in the synagogues. And guess what? If you're going to be taught the Old Testament, you better learn how to read Hebrew. Okay? Now, of course, you got the Greek Septuagint, so some of the synagogues could have, they could, it was one, even in Jerusalem, there was a synagogue um, uh, that was basically for Hellenistic speaking Jews. That's where uh, Paul probably did some teaching there as a rabbi before he became a Christian, but Stephen as well. And I, I think Paul may have held the close for Stephen because Stephen, he may have lost the debate to Stephen. He may have said, man, if I can't beat this guy in debate, you might as well. Stoned to death. I'll approve the stoning to death of this this guy. I can't refute him. And then it's really crazy. You look at Stephen's sermon and Paul's letters. There's a lot in common there. Hmm. You had your hand hand up. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so so basically, uh, Sephorus was the, 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 the Galilee was not during the time of Christ was not heavily influenced by Greek culture um, and uh, the existence of synagogues throughout first century Israel shows that in fact I was in one in Capernaum when I went to Israel and the, the lower stones went all the way back to the, the time of Christ and then the other stones were like from 3rd or 4th century AD but they knew that Capernaum I mean you know, you could stroll. You could take a nice little easy walk from Nazareth to Capernaum, and there was a there was a uh, synagogue right there. And uh, uh, okay, so the Jews rejected pagan ideas. Um, we already mentioned the 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 mystery religions. Uh, the mystery religions that are referred to that Christianity borrowed from, those elements of the mystery religions actually post-date Christianity. Uh, virtually all the evidence from these religions come from 2nd to 4th century. So the, the borrowing occurred, they're borrowing from Christianity at, um, at that point. Also, the mystery religions were not as widespread as once thought. There is now um, considered doubtful that the mystery religions pagan mystery religions had a foothold in, uh, in Judea and even Galilee for that matter. It was, it's now pretty much recognized that though many of these ancient mystery religions were all over the place in the Roman Empire, um, they're almost completely absent in um, uh, first century uh, uh, Israel. Um, we already mentioned there's a great overemphasizing or exaggerating of similarities between Christianity and the uh, pagan mystery religions. Uh, many terms found in mystery religions were also used in Jewish circles before the mystery religions came into being. So that's another. So every once in a while they're using a term and it's not, you know, it's a term that the actually the mystery religions used even before Christianity, but it's a term that was also common among the Jews of ancient times. Uh, uh, the uh, the differences are all are uh, downplayed by Robert Price and company. Uh, the dying and rising gods are very ambiguous before Christianity. They're more tied in, like I said earlier, to the crop cycles, to the seasons, to vegetation dying, and then the rebirth of nature. Um, it's after Christianity when it sound, starts sounding more and more like literal resurrections. Uh, we know that Jesus was a, 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 not only a real historical person, but a recent historical person. So let's talk a little bit about this. Jesus was a real historical person. but he was also a recent historical person. How do we know that? You go to Paul's writings, and 
Paul talks about not only Jesus, but his apostles, his disciples, knowing the guys that knew Jesus. Just the fact that Paul in his letters says that his apostleship was often questioned, and he was treated as a second level, second class apostle by some people, and it was because he didn't walk with Jesus like these other guys did until after Jesus ascended, then he appeared, started appearing to Paul. Uh, but Paul refers to James, the brother of Jesus. By the way, not only does Paul refer to uh, James as the brother of Jesus, um, but Josephus, the Jewish historian, when he records James's death, he refers to James as the brother of Jesus. Now he's mentioned, oh yeah, he, 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 I think he mentions him as James, the brother of Jesus, I'll have to check it out, uh, who is called Christ, but I'll have to check it out. But whatever the case, it makes no sense for Josephus to identify James as the brother of Jesus unless he's already told us who Jesus is. Which means that passage earlier about Jesus, uh, his followers believed he was the Christ, he performed wonderful works, and then he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and then his disciples reported they saw him alive on the third day after his death. Um, it means that that passage actually, Josephus did mention Jesus earlier. Contra the, 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 the Jesus legend theorists, they just throw all this out. They just throw it. They just, you know, if a judge allows a jury or a lawyer to do that, your case is over. If all your evidence just automatically gets tossed out because it's your evidence, well then obviously you're not going to be able to build a case, but I would argue that that's very unfair. So he was a real historical person and a recent historical person. He was worshipped early, such as the 30s, early 30s AD. We already talked about Larry Hurtado. So this is not like some legend that took centuries to develop. And, uh, and so there's good historical evidence, good evidence for Jesus' life. Now they say, you know, oh, Jesus, Jesus is just like uh, Apollonius of Tyana. Well, Richard Dawkins, you make a lot of money now debating Christians about Jesus' resurrection. How much money have you made debating followers of Apollonius of Tyana? The answer is zero. Yet, Richard Dawkins says believing in God is like believing in the flying spaghetti monster. How much money has Richard Dawkins made lecturing on college campuses against the existence of the flying spaghetti monster? Zero. He hasn't made a dime doing that. So, he sees, oh, Jesus, God is just like the flying spaghetti monster. Jesus is just like Apollonius of Tyana. Well, nobody else sees what you see, bud. Because they're, they're totally, totally different. Um... So, uh, so whatever the case, we, with Jesus, there's good historical evidence for him, and you don't find that with the uh, with the other supposed dying and rising gods. Let me just give you a, a brief overview of the dying and rising gods. Uh, Adonis, according, according to Eddie and Boyd, in pages 142 to 147, Paul, Eddie, and Gregory Boyd, and they're the Jesus legend. Adonis, there's no death or resurrection ever recorded about Adonis until after Jesus lived. Okay? Addis, there's a death but no rebirth and he's not supposed to be a god. He's not a deity. Osiris, we already talked about that. Murdered and dismembered. He didn't die for anybody's sins. He just was murdered and dismembered, chopped up into 14 pieces. 13 of the pieces were reassembled and then he becomes a powerful god in the netherworld or the underworld. Um, Tammuz, a recent find of a Sumerian text, uh, shows no resurrection or rebirth. So in other words, any resurrection of Tammuz apparently postdates Christianity. Baal, Isis, and Dionysius 
also fail as dying and rising gods. And if you want the details there, just see Eddie and Boyd. Also, um, they talk about Jesus and the hero myth. Uh, the hero myth is like this mythical hero. And it's not really based in history. And they say, well, Jesus has so many similarities to that. But they focus on the similarities but ignore the differences. The mythic pattern, according to Eddie and Boyd, does not automatically rule out real history. You have historical persons who often fit the hero myth pattern. Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, John F. Kennedy, even William Wallace, Braveheart, all fit the hero myth pattern, yet were real historical persons. Uh, but then also, some aspects of the hero myth pattern are missing in Jesus. He's never depicted as a warrior king. Instead, he's depicted as a teacher, a servant, and a miracle worker, contrary to the hero myth pattern. So what we'll do next week, we'll look at uh, uh, Apollonius of Tyana, Sabbatai Savi, and, uh, and then Simon Kimbangu, uh, three supposed examples of how somebody could be deified and legends develop about the guy either just, just shortly after the guy's life or during his life.